Great. Uh, okay. I think I've already talked about myself. Uh, let let me let me just say um, a word about my my trajectory in terms of I I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at digital inequalities and inequality in general in in the global south. I'm from Latin America, uh, so a lot of my work, previous work, has been on on um, and countries in Latin America and, and global south in general. But since since the pandemic, I, I've really uh, um, shift gears uh, and look a lot more uh, in the U.S. context. And and I think there's there's a there's a few reasons for that. But one of them, I think, is the pandemic really changed the policy conversation about internet access and broadband in the US. Um, because the pandemic exposed uh, how fragile the internet access uh, and connectivity uh, situation was for a lot of vulnerable and low income families in, in the US context. And this may not have been news for many of us here in this call, but but it, it really took the pandemic to expose that to and, and, and to show how not having reliable access to affordable internet in combination with other factors reduces opportunities for economic mobility, reduces educational opportunities for children that have to do their homework on parking lots at, at, the, at, the, at the library or at the Starbucks. It reduces access to information about health, about uh, government services. And perhaps more generally, it reduces the opportunity to, to participate in today's political and cultural conversations. So it's perhaps a basic fact, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it took the pandemic to really expose those facts and to make digital equity a priority for policy in the US. So the pandemic completely changed the terms of the conversation around broadband policy here in the US. Um, and in many ways brought us back to fundamental questions about equitable access to infrastructure. So it's interesting to see the parallels between the conversations we're having today about broadband and the conversations in the 20s and 30s about access to electricity and access to basic telephony. These are very similar conversations that at the time led to large public investments and, and initiatives to guarantee a basic level of service for all US households. And, and some of that is happening today, although um, we can then talk about how that's becoming, uh, or that's a lot more, a lot different than the conversations uh, we had in the 20s and 30s uh, because of the policy environment is different. Um, and, and from an academic perspective, I think it's also interesting that the pandemic brought us back to some of the early conversations around the digital divide that we first had in the late or mid 90s. Um, and this is interesting because to some extent, um, the, those of uh, academics working in the digital equity space in many ways had moved on from access, have moved on from access to literacy, to skills, to outcomes. And this, is, this, is, this is, remains very critical because ultimately digital inclusion is about social justice, is about equal opportunities. But, but this transition and evolution of the field from access to skills and literacy and to outcomes, in many ways, relegated some of the basic questions about access and infrastructure to the back burner. So the, the pandemic brought us back in some ways to the same conversations, but, but at the same time, armed with a better foundation, empirical and theoretical foundation that perhaps did not exist when we first talk about the digital divide in, in the 1990s. Uh, and, and perhaps uh, last, uh, I think one of the reasons uh, my work has been more U.S. focused uh, since the pandemic is that working at USC really exposes you to this massive inequality in, in, in terms of access, because we are at this amazing university with all these resources, with some of the supercomputer centers and, and really a, a lot of the internet really was in some ways, uh, U, USC has a really uh, strong connection to the start of the internet and we, um, we are very proud of that. 
And yet a few blocks down the street, literally a few blocks down the street from USC, you find some of the least connected census tracts in the whole United States, literally a few blocks from our campus. And some of those areas in, in, in South LA and, and Southeast LA are, are trapped in what I call a, a cycle of broadband poverty because the service providers have very little interest in investing or upgrading their infrastructure in those areas. There's very little competition. Prices are high as a result. Services are slow, which means that households can not afford the service or they don't want to pay for a service that is not a good quality service. So it's a cycle that we see repeatedly um, with not only with broad, but with all kinds of public infrastructure in some of those disadvantaged communities. Um, so so um, let, let me perhaps show you something that I, I like to show my, my, uh, my students that I think it's a good uh, way to start some of these conversations. And I showed them this, this uh, graph where um, you see on the y-axis, on the left, you see a measure of income inequality. That is the share of income that goes to the top 1% of earners in the US. And as you probably know, inequality has gone up tremendously since the 70s. And then on the other line, the red line is the share of internet adoption in the US. And you can see uh, uh, that those lines are tracking uh, fairly closely. Now, of course, the first thing we teach our students in a, in a quantitative class is this is just correlation. It may be completely spurious. This doesn't say anything. Um, and there's lots of examples of this kinds of spurious correlations. Um, here's a few of my favorites. Uh, the, the per capita cheese consumption relates to the number of people who die becoming tangled in their bed sheet. Did you know you could die entangled in your bed sheet? I didn't know that, but not only did you know that, but it also correlates with per capita cheese consumption. So obviously these are uh, uh, spurious correlations. Uh, but again, this does raise questions. It raises questions about the way in which the internet has become part of our, our, our economic uh, fabric, our, our social fabric has become part of education, has become part of the labor market. Um, and it raises questions about whether the internet has exacerbated existing mechanisms of social stratification or perhaps has even created new mechanisms for social stratification. So in my research, and these are the big questions that I ask is, what are the pathways that are linking internet adoption and social inequality? Has it not only exacerbated, but created new ways in which, um, in which inequality persists or is exacerbated? And also in terms of a, um, policy intervention and, and community action, under what circumstances can the internet help mitigate or reduce some of this uh, inequalities that, that persist. So these are some of the big questions I try to ask in my research. Um, so what I, what I thought I would do is give you a, 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 a small summary, a short summary of some of the research and the ways in which I try to address these questions. Um, and I picked some of the projects and knowing, I'm glad that uh, in the presentation, I, I see a lot of you are very involved in community action and activism. So I picked the projects that are really close very actionable uh, and, and, and that we did in, in, in partnership with, with community actors. Um, so um, I'll talk about quickly about three projects. Uh, let me start with what we call the Cyber Shelter Study, which is, is really about social capital formation in a very marginalized community. Um, and these are the uh, community of, of homeless community that exists all over the, the, the United States, but is particularly large in, in, in LA, in the area that's called the Skid Row um, in downtown LA. Um, so we, we did a study where we, we wanted to understand the patterns of, of use and adoption of, of internet among Skid Row residents. Uh, we work closely with one of the community partners that is very active in, in that area. It's called LA CAN. Um, and uh, trying to try to understand whether Internet access provided uh, uh, 
uh, or help people access resources, particularly networks of support, which are really critical for people that, that are experiencing homelessness. Um, and, um, and some of the findings, what, what, what was really interesting in that study is that we, uh, we saw a lot of parallels between the conversations around housing security and access to security. That is, for those of you who have worked with in the homelessness space, it, people are not homeless. People experience homeless at different points in their lives. Of course, there's chronic homelessness, but a lot of people come in and out of homeless, homelessness very, uh, at various points in their lives. And we saw there was a really interesting parallel because when we interview and we survey um, homeless residents, the same things happens with, with internet access. It is not that they're connected or disconnected. It changes over time, sometimes over, over the same day because um, uh, access is mostly mobile uh, over mobile phone, tablets. Tablets are stolen, tablets are disconnected, they break, they can be charged. We found that charging your device is a major, major barrier to internet access among people that live, uh, th that, are, that are homeless. Um, so we borrow from housing security to, to, to uh, uh, put forward this notion of access and security. That is what really characterizes access, internet access among uh, people um, in this, uh, that experience homelessness is, is access and security, not knowing whether they're gonna have access uh, depending on time of the day, depending on whether they get the check or not, depending on, on, on all these factors that create access insecurity. Um, and, and in terms of, 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 of an, another interesting finding is that we did find that people who have more stable access and more reliable access do indeed create communities of support among, among this, this population. And in particular, they have less... Um, sorry, there's a typo here, less homophilic networks, which means their networks of, of family and friends are, are less like themselves. And that's really critical because when people who are homeless connect with other people who are homeless, they can create support networks, but they don't have, they only have access to a certain number of resources. So this is a classic example of strength of weak ties. The more people who are homeless have ties to people who are not homeless, the better their chances of coming out of homelessness. And that's very well established. And having internet access creates or facilitates these types of connections with people who are not as themselves on the streets. So that's, that's again, very quick summary of, of the cyber shelter study. Um, I should also mention that once we found out that Charging was a, was was the one of the main barriers. Um, we partnered with the uh, community organization there called LA Can, and we created this char mobile charging station. So this is a bicycle um, that is uh, pulling a car that is solar power, and then you have uh, a few charging uh, stations where people could charge their phones. But this was also a part of what we thought was a nice uh, way of. Uh, a small intervention, but uh, that that created uh, that that help our partnership with with our community partner uh, LA Can uh, in <clears throat> in Skid Row. Okay, um, second uh, study uh, is is a a study on um, the uh, pandemic uh, or education during the pandemic. I don't know if you've seen, but there's there's been a really great article around and a study published by uh, Stanford researchers about learning loss during the pandemic just a few days ago. Um, uh, so this is very much related to that. We did a study um, uh, with a, an organization that manages uh, schools, 20, 20 schools in in some of the uh, some of the very low income areas in in, in LA. So just just to give you a sense, this is the um, this is the map of California and we map uh, pre-COVID, so 2019, how many, uh, what share of households had internet access and a computer looking only at households that had K-12 uh, students. Um, and you can see that there's a story around urban and rural areas where rural areas are less, uh, less well equipped. Uh, 
But also zooming in LA, which is on the right, you can see that within LA you have pockets where um, uh, less than half of the households had high-speed internet and computer uh, before the pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, all the schools transition online, those households had a really hard time transitioning to online education. So we launched a survey in summer, so right after school ended in 2020, uh, really the, the, some of the worst time of the pandemic, right? March, April, May, and June of 2020. And we launched this survey with, um, in partnership with the organization that managed a lot of the schools, so 20 schools in um, where you see those pockets of light green in South LA and East LA. Um, so it was a survey of families uh, with the student population, uh, not surprisingly, is, is uh, mostly black, uh, uh, mostly actually Hispanic, some black, uh, 25, 24% uh, English learners, uh, most of them on free or reduced price lunch. So very, very much a, uh, <clears throat> the, the low income uh, uh, population here in the schools. And what was interesting is because we were working with the school um, administrators, we were managed to match the survey with administrative student data. Now we wanted to, we wanted to, talk about student achievement. The problem is in, in 2020, uh, after the pandemic hit, the LAUSD, uh, the school district, as many other, around the nation, decided not to have grades for that period. So we couldn't have, we couldn't uh, look at grades. So we look at two proxies, which is student motivation, homework completion. And, and what we were interested in is to the extent to which having online instruction matter for this outcomes, homework completion and student motivation. And we measure that by the number of, uh, uh, by, by, by the number of hours that people, the students had online, uh, online classes or live online classes, right? So we we'll call live instruction. Um, and we, 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 we build a sort of essentially a model where we model these outcomes uh, on, uh, on all the other variables uh, where our main interest was, what the effect of live instruction was. Um, and we see that uh, particularly for elementary school children, having live instruction really matter in terms of homework completion and student motivation. Perhaps a little less for middle and high school students, but still matter. And this very much is, is related to the, uh, the idea of learning loss, that the more, essentially the better equipped you were before the pandemic, that you had access, you had a computer at home, it really mattered in terms of the, the quality of the uh, education that, that again, everyone suffered during the, the pandemic, but uh, the, the pain was not evenly distributed. A lot of the learning losses were really concentrated among low income and racial minority households. Um, how am I doing with time? Uh, Molly is our timekeeper. Do I have time for a last study? Yeah, let's let's get the last study in. Okay, okay. Uh, last study is is uh, perhaps more uh, related to the types of studies that you may be uh, more familiar, which is a study not about access and infrastructure per se, but what happens within online communities. And in this, in this case, we looked at um, a very large um, labor, uh, gig labor platform. Um, and the, the motivation for the study was um, a, a lot of, uh, there, were, there, were a lot, there was a lot of conversation uh, back in the 2000s around the idea that labor markets were, as a result of the internet, labor markets were becoming, it's called flat, meaning it, it evened the playing field for everyone around the world, no matter where you were, there was no more advantage to being close to the employer. So the, this is the idea of the world is flat by Thomas Friedman, the death of distance, all those books that came out at that time, arguing that 
the internet created a completely even playing field and suddenly employers would hire regardless of anybody's location characteristics and so forth. Um, so it's a study really of how the internet is uh, changing uh, labor markets for, for a specific slice of the labor market. We look at a, a gig uh, labor platform where jobs could be done remotely. Um, so um, since we are in the Chatham rules, we, we publish this, we, we never reveal the name of the platform, but this is, this is Upwork. Uh, actually, this is a company that Upwork bought. So I, uh, the name was different, now I'm blanking on the name, but this is a, a fairly large company that operated out of Spain, um, then eventually was actually in the middle of the study was bought by Upwork. So again, these are remote uh, uh, gigs. Um, so we had access to all the information um, for every job, every bid, who is the employer, who is the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the worker that's bidding for the job. Um, and our interest was really testing the idea that is it really a flat labor market so it doesn't really matter where you are. And what we find is that there is, uh, for many reasons, that is actually not true, that there's still a, a home advantage where, uh, where, where, so, so let me just explain the model. So this is the, so the odds of winning a bid for, for workers that are different from the country where the job is posted relative to workers from the same country where the job is posted. So if you're a foreign worker, obviously, Bid amount is the basic control here because the, the 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 more you bid, the less likely you get to get the job. But even if you just control for bid amount, the odds of a foreign worker being hired are forty two percent relative to the odds of the um, of the worker from the country at the same country of the um, of the employer posted the job. And as you add more controls timing, work experience, uh, reputation, uh, and so forth, the odds are increasing, but never quite reach the same as the, the, the home worker. So essentially this, this uh, is, is showing is that even though there, there, there are opportunities in this markets for foreign workers, there's still uh, quite a bit of home advantage to workers that are located in the same, uh, country as the uh, as the employers and and we we discuss why this is this is the case um, and, and and what we take out from this and and this is something that perhaps a good conversation started here is what our study is showing is that there's been a lot of conversation around automated bias and the bias in algorithms and all kinds of bias that comes from uh, from from these platforms, but from the side of the or from the perspective of how are these platforms automating bias in their algorithms and so forth? What we think it's our studies showing is that this is also made a lot more uh, uh, that that we can't ignore the plain old human bias here, because uh, we tested some some different we test some different models and we find that regardless of the types of um, algorithms and, 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 and the way information is presented, what we find here is that there's a lot of plain old human bias that interacts with the bias in the, uh, in the algorithms. But, but we perhaps wanted to bring back uh, the fact that not only there is, not only automated bias exists, but also that uh, it has to be understood within the conversation around what we know about human bias. So I'll stop here. Uh, you'll see, you can see a lot more of what we do in our website and that's uh, my email if you'd like to know more about it.